So the next um, concept associated with absorption is something known as bioavailability. And all bioavailability is a big word, but all it means is the percentage of the drug that actually makes it into the body, into your central compartment. Okay, so imagine that you swallow a pill, a 100 milligram tablet. Okay, I swallow a 100 milligram tablet, and that 100 milligram tablet gets absorbed into your, into your gut and into your intestines, and then it goes through the mesenteric circulation into the liver and it gets metabolized by, you know, it has a first pass effect. And at the end of the day, 50 milligrams of that medication actually makes it into your circulatory system. What percentage of that medication made it in? 50%. The percentage of medication that makes it, actually makes it through the absorption process is known as bioavailability. Is everybody okay with that? What bioavailability is, and you may have you may run into questions about bioavailability. It'll say, um, I, uh, 500 milligrams of some medication with a bioavailability of 0 0.8 was given. Okay, so that means that that has an 80 percent bioavailability. So how much of that would act ultimately make it into the circulation? Huh? Yeah, what's 80% of 500? 400. 400, right? 400. 400. What are those these tests that you're just going to say? Well, on the exams, no. though. <laughs> Everybody's okay with that. You, you, you get the concept, right? You just multiply 500 by 0 0.8. Okay, cool. Some medications have a really high bioavailability. Things like, like uh, acetaminophen or Tylenol has like 60 to 80% bioavailability. Other medications, not so high. All right, if you give something IV, what can you pretty much assume about its bioavailability? 100%. 100%, yeah. If you give something IV, you, you basically bypass absorption. You don't have to worry about it. Okay, bioavailability is influenced by a lot of things. How soluble is the drug? What form is it in? What root is it given, obviously? pH is a huge, huge factor in the bioavailability of drugs. pH plays a big role, and I wish I could talk about this in more detail, but it involves concepts that are just, I just don't have the time to really, really cover that stuff. But pH is a, such a big deal when it comes to how something can get absorbed. And pH is a really big deal when it comes to like how do I get something out of the body, like in an overdose situation. But but again, I just don't we don't have really the time, and and you're not really going to see those types of questions on the <coughs> National Registry. Okay. So at the end of the day, I need to cross membranes. Does that make sense? For a drug to get into the body, it needs to cross membranes. It needs to get through the intestinal mucosa. It needs to go through the mu the uh, mesenteric circulation needs to get into the hepatic cells or the hepatocytes where the enzymes are. So these membranes, as we talked about in pathophysiology, they're barriers though, right? They prevent molecules from passing through them. And we know, going back to review pathophys, that the cell membrane is primarily a lipid bilayer, right? A phospholipid bilayer. So if you had to guess, what kinds of drugs do you think would get absorbed Enterally, at least, easier. Polar drugs or nonpolar drugs? Non Your nonpolar drugs tend to have an easier time getting absorbed. Why? Because they can pass through membranes better, right? Does that make sense? So let's say that you swallow a drug that becomes nonpolar under very basic environments. Okay? So in an alkaline environment, a drug becomes nonpolar. Do you think that drug is going to get absorbed very well in your stomach? No, your stomach's acidic, right? And the, uh, the pH of your stomach turns that drug into its polar form, so it doesn't get absorbed. But what happens is it travels through the intestinal tract, and you get down further where the pH is much more alkaline. Then what's going to happen? The drug will get turned into its nonpolar form, and then you'll have absorption occur. So. Absorption, the drugs, lots of drugs, where they're absorbed in the GI tract, real, a, lot, a lot of cases depends on the pH 
of, of the GI tract there. And of course, when you have GI disorders, GI disorders can really profoundly affect how certain substances are absorbed. All right, so yeah, non-ionized or non-polar stuff gets through membranes better. Ionized drugs don't penetrate membranes, but ionized drugs are really good at dissolving in water. So if you give something like normal saline, for, for example, that normal saline is gonna be really good at staying where? In your vascular compartment when you give it, right? If I give a very non-ionized drug IV, that drug is gonna to tend to do what? It's gonna to tend to leave the vascular compartment, right? It's gonna to tend to, because it can pass <coughs> through membranes so much easier, it will go into other cells. It will leave the central compartment, the circulation, and it will go into you know, fatty compartments, for example. Does that, does that kind of make sense? So pH and the, the, the polarity and uh, the non-polarity of, of substances just makes a huge, huge deal. Okay, so just some uh, basic review of absorption. So if I have something that can't just pass through a membrane easily, it has to get through a channel or a receptor, right, to get through into the cell. And you guys remember passive diffusion, right? Okay, just simple passive diffusion. <clears throat> facilitated passive diffusion is like insulin facilitating glucose entering the cell. Okay, no energy here, right? No energy. Active transport is transporting against a gradient. Of course, there's energy here. Ion channels, okay, you have sodium channels, potassium channels, magnesium, calcium channels, and these channels allow ions to flow some ways and other ways. And what's phenocytosis? It's a fairly rare thing that happens for drug absorption, but worth mentioning. So phenocytosis is kind of where you have your, your cell kind of grabs, and it grabs that um, particular drug and then pulls it in. It's very similar to phagocytosis. We talk about white blood cells and how the white blood cells actually go out there and find stuff and then engulf it. Penocytosis would be like um, your intestinal mucosa and those cells just kind of with the little filaments grabbing the drug and then pulling it in. It's not, it's not as common as uh, transport channels. Okay, passive diffusion, we talked about that. Okay, concentration gradients, rule here. If I, have a, if I ingest a drug and I have a high concentration of drug in my intestine and a low concentration of drug in my body, Where's that drug going to want to go? It's going to want to go from the intestine into the body, and that gradient can be used to facilitate the movement of that drug. All right. And obviously, the more lipid soluble that is, or what we call lipophilic or non-charged, the easier it is for that drug to pass through membranes and get into your body. All right. All right. We talked about pH. Okay. We know that already. Um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here. Uh, we know that our stomach pH is very, very low, like one to two. We know that the intestinal pH is still low, but it's significantly higher, right? What's the difference between a pH of two and four? 100. 100, right? Okay, four is 100 times more basic than two. Does that make sense? And then five would be a thousand times more basic than two. Everyone okay with that? Um, so pretty big difference there. All right. We talked a little bit about un uh, unionized versus mm -hmm. ionized. Um, like I said, I'm not, you're not gonna be tested on this here. Okay, the PKA, those of you guys that, I know there's a biologist in here, right? You remember talking about this stuff in, bio in your, your classes, I bet. A little bit, yeah. Um, this is known as the acid dissociation constant. It's the log of the Ka, which is a dissociation constant. You can see how this is getting kind of out of hand. But this number allows us to predict what pH a drug is gonna be ionized or non-ionized in. You're not gonna to have to memorize any of that stuff there, okay? Facilitated passive diffusion, we know what that is, right? Some substance facilitates the diffusion of another substance into the cell, okay? You're not gonna to have to memorize any specifics. Active transport, we know what that is as well, right? We know that this requires energy, you're going against the concentration gradient. 
This may occur with some medications. They may need to be actively <clears throat> transported across membranes. All right, and then ion channels. We know the major ions, sodium, potassium, calcium, um, chloride, magnesium, you can throw in there as well, okay? And these ion channels can open and close, okay? And they can open or close into, in response to certain types of stimuli, pH, pain, um, tactile, uh, some sort of chemical mediator, or chemical messengers, hormones, what have you, can cause those channels to open and close and those channels can help the flow of ions across membranes into and out of the cell. All right, penocytosis, we talked about this a little bit. Um, it's not as common as some of the other things. Okay, so that's absorption. So now I've absorbed my drug. My drug is now in the systemic circulation. It's made it through the first pass and all that. What is the primary vehicle for getting that drug around the body, if you had to guess? The bloodstream, yeah, the circulatory system is going to be that primary vehicle for distributing it. So distribution is, it goes out to the tissues. Now, distribution is pretty uneven, okay? It gets distributed out very unevenly. But because it is so damn complicated, to model distribution, we simplify it. And we say that it distributes out into the blood evenly, okay? And we use that as a starting point for distribution. Obviously, that's not really the case, but it's a good starting point and it helps us understand some things, okay? So yeah, the big point here is the bloodstream is our major vehicle for distribution. So guess what? You need to have good blood flow to have good distribution. If you have a fat or water soluble drug, that's going to determine where it gets distributed to. Does that make sense? If it's water soluble, it's going to tend to stay in the, in the vascular compartment. If it's fat soluble, it's going to tend to leave the, wa the water compartment and move into more fat. And then protein binding. Protein binding is kind of the, it can really mix things up. Okay. What protein binding means is certain drugs will actually bind to proteins in your bloodstream. If a drug binds to a plat, we call a plasma protein like albumin, is that drug going to be able to do anything in the body? No. Generally speaking, drugs that get bound to plasma proteins, they're bound. They, they're, they're not able to have any sort of action. And what makes a drug bind to a plasma protein, in a lot of cases, comes down to pH. You can change the pH of the body, and that pH may cause more or less plasma protein binding. For example, there are a class of drugs called the tricyclic antidepressants, or the TCAs. You guys sort of familiar or heard those before? TCAs are highly protein bound. So if somebody overdoses on a TCA, one of the things we can do is we can increase the pH in the body. We can make you more alkaline. And making you more alkaline will cause the TCAs to bind to more proteins. And that deactivates that, that particular drug. That drug's not able to, to bind to uh, sodium channels in your heart and other places in your brain. Does that kind of make sense? So by changing the pH of the body, you can actually change the, the different types of protein binding that uh, drugs experience. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to stop here because the volume of distribution is a, a funny concept, um, and I, I, wanna, I don't want to just rush over it and everybody's really confused. So I'm going to stop here. Uh, we'll get you guys to lunch. Let's see here. I'll see you guys at about 1.10. Should give you plenty of time to, to get out and do what you need to do. And we'll pick this back up.